Darwin's observations and conclusions. So his observations were that species are not evenly distributed. So for example, Australia has kangaroos, but no rabbits. Hello, kangaroo. Hello. Hello, Joey. South America had llamas. In the slum picture. There are extinct species. So this is a species that existed and doesn't anymore. So he collected both living organisms and fossils. <clears throat> the fossils he collected included extinct an animals like trilobites yep, and the um, giant ground sloth of South America. And so he wondered what had happened to the species that used to exist but no longer do. Another observation, um, if left unchecked, the number of organisms of each species will increase exponentially generation to generation. So, <laughs> so baby, bunnies have lots and lots of babies. <laughs> That's great. God, you like that one. <laughs> but so the bunnies will have lots and lots of babies, but in nature, populations tend to remain pretty stable um, in size. So this population is, you know, growing a little bit, but not really. Unless the environment is destroyed, though. Right. But in general, populations stay pretty stable. So environmental, re the reason is because environmental resources are limited. So this bunny um, only has so much grass to eat, and if it has to share the grass with a hundred other bunnies... Then some of them are going to die. Exactly. Which is why bunnies don't share. So Darwin's conclusions. The production of more individuals than can be supported by the environment leads to a struggle for survival among individuals. So some of the bunnies get the food and some of them don't. Or overproduction. Well, that's the overproduction. So here's the struggle for survival. Some of them get eaten or some mm. of them don't get enough food. So sad, huh? Oh, no. Oh, no. So only a fraction of the offspring survive to each generation. And that's what he called survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. So maybe this bunny is faster than the others, so it survives. Can run away from the foxes. Right. Maybe that bunny hides better or has a deeper hole, and so that one survives better. And maybe that one's better... Camouflage. Yeah, so that one survives better. The ones that are not as fast or not as well camouflaged or don't have a good hole um, wouldn't survive and wouldn't... We don't have, like, two holes. <clears throat> right. Escape route. Right, and so they wouldn't survive into the next generation. So more observations. Individuals of a population can vary a lot. So, for example, this butterfly is um, brown and black, and this one's black and white, but they're the same species, I think. Much of this variation between individuals is inherited. The individuals who inherit characteristics most fit... For the environment. Exactly. So are likely to... So that before you on. did, I saw that. Are likely to survive, um, or are likely to leave more offspring than less fit individuals. So there's a lot of variation. The ones who are better fit for that environment live and have babies, and the other ones die. So, for example... If it's um, a bunny. yeah, if it's um, around here, then this bunny might do better. And if it's an Arctic bunny, then that one might do better. That one over here, how would it do? Um, it would do horribly. Unless it's one of those bunnies that like changes. Let's color. say it didn't. Let's okay. say it was always it would, white. It would um get caught pretty quickly. And how about this bunny over here? Um, it would probably get caught pretty quickly. So it hit in the brush. Well, it was all the way. It would still get caught. So here's the key to all this stuff, the characteristics for that particular environment, because... There's more than one environment out there. Right, and so a mutation, a variation, isn't necessarily better, period. It's just better for that environment. So this mutation's better for that environment, and this variation or mutation's better for that environment. So this is called natural selection. So here's how he explained the finches. Food sources differed on each island, so each habitat selected for a different type of finch. 
Finches with longer beaks were better able to catch bugs, and so these finches survived if the bugs were around, but did not survive if the food present was large seeds. So they were out so, by the other finches. Right. So on, a, on an island with a whole bunch of variation in finches, on an island where there's all kinds of bugs to catch, these would die. Because they need fruit. Because they Cause, eat fruit. Well, yeah, because their beak isn't very good for catching bugs. Um, but these would do just great. Oh, on an, and an, alternately on an environment like in a different island where there was fruit, fruit to, to crush, this one would do great and this kind would die. So it really isn't that that one's better than that one or that one's better than that one. It's Just that one. That one's better in its, in its own, own environment. Right, and that one's better. In its own environment. Beautiful. That's exactly it. So finches with larger beaks were better able to eat large seeds. So these finches survived if large seeds were around, but did not survive if the food present was bugs. So, oops. So there's that one. And the other one. Let's go back and look at this picture. So, um, bud eater, insect eater, cactus eater, seed eaters. You can see kind of the variation in the beaks here and what they look like. Um, the insect one, this tiny little beak would not do very well if it had to eat the, the big um, seeds, for example. And this one wouldn't do very well if it had to eat little bugs. Those are some ground finches too, aren't they? Um, yeah, ground finches versus tree finches. So probably the food available is different when yeah, you're you eating. Yeah, you have to pick it up off of the ground versus out of a tree. Right. So evolution is a change in a population over of organisms horses. over time. It's horses. So sometimes one thing that I hate on a sci-fi show, they'll talk about an individual evolving. Ooh, he's the most evolved. Um, it's actually a population that evolves. So it's the whole population that changes over well, time. He's the best mutated or whatever. He might have a great adaptation, yeah. but it would have to change the whole population. Yeah, but it's not just. Unless it's a flower that um, does mitosis instead of meiosis and produces, like if it, if it becomes, um, species. Yeah, it, it can actually. If it doubles its chromosome number in one generation, they can sometimes survive, and that would be a new species. But um, for the rest of us, it happens over, long, over a period of time. So here's the original horse, and horses are pretty well... Um, it's three-toed. Yeah, they're, they're pretty well um, documented in the, in the fossils. So here's the present-day horse. With the hoof. Um, yeah, with a hoof. So this is actually one toe, and it's a hoof now. Um, but you can see it's changed yeah, over time. Here's the, the three toes. I think that one is three toes, too. This one, I thought it had four in the front and three in the back, maybe. I don't know. I, I colored on top of it. But yeah, maybe it's a three-toed one. Anyway, they changed, changed, changed over time. And um, so... Yeah, they eventually got a hoof. They did. <clears throat> Natural selection is the unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce, which leads to a gradual change in the population with favorable characteristics accumulating over generations. So natural selection is the driving force for evolution. So let's take a look at this one. During the struggle for resources, the organism, the best fit organisms survive and reproduce. So let's talk about that in this case. So here you have a whole bunch of bugs and that one happens to have um, a different gene than all of the others, giving it a resistance to a particular insecticide. So an insecticide kills bugs. That one happens to have a mutation for it. Um, it was a random mutation that doesn't really affect it much until it <laughs> until the, the plants come by and spray poison or... And poison <clears throat> your food. Yeah, well, and spray the insecticide all over um, the plants. These all die. Oh, man. And this one survives. So guess what kind of babies it has? The same kind. Same kind. And so a few generations so later... Is asexual then? Well, let's assume that it was more pregnant or there's more than one, yeah. Um, or if somebody else survives and it mates with the other one, at least half of the babies have the mutation. So you can imagine over several generations that um, you would have a whole bunch of resistant bugs. So at least some of the differences between individuals which affect their survival and fertility are inherited. So some of your differences are probably environmental, but a lot of the differences between these bugs would be genetic in your DNA. So in this case, there was some naturally occurring variation between the bugs in the population. So one mistake kids make all the time is that they say, oh, that one needed to mutate to survive. Not true. This one had the mutation. It was totally random. 
Um, and then there was the it insecticide. It needed that mutation to survive, but it didn't actually mutate. Right, it already, time, it already was mutated. Right, it already had the mutation. So the insecticide killed 99% of the bugs, the bu but the bugs with the resistance mutation survived and had babies. Now the population is different. That's evolution right there. And now um, they need a new insecticide. Yeah, now they need a new insecticide. That's exactly right. <clears throat> So you already know that sexually reproducing populations have more diversity. Yep, or variation, same oh. thing. Then it's okay. Then asexually reproducing populations. But what is the ultimate source of variation in any population? Mutation. Beautiful. Oh, mutation. So, for example, here's the DNA code, and if the C gets replaced with a T, now you have a totally different protein. Um, that's a mutation. Any change in the DNA. And so this is the famous peppered moth experiment. Uh, not experiment, but a uh, oh, yeah, with natural the, um, experiment, in, really. In, um, with the Industrial Revolution. Exactly. They destroyed all the trees. Exactly. So, well, they at least covered them all with soot. So chance creates new genetic variations by mutation and sexual re recombination. Don't they? Um, on the peppered moth, so don't they, like, um, isn't the only, like, original peppered moths only in captivity or something like that? Oh, I don't know. So I heard that they still exist, but they're not really. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. So let's go over the peppered moth thing now. So on the pre-industrial revolution, the trees are all nice and clean like this. And guess who survived better? The one that looked like the tree. Yep. So these got p p picked off and eaten. So this was a, a bad variation for that one. Then after the industrial revolution, the trees looked like this. And guess who got eaten? Um, The one who didn't have the camouflage right mutation. right so now this is the bad mutation so this is the bad variation so your diverse the diversity in the genetics here really Same. especially in this case it well it depends Same on the environment it did yeah that's true too but it really depends on the environment so in this environment this one's better and in this environment this one's better so after the industrial revolution um, and they cleaned up the soot the trees looked more like this and again that kind got more popular in the gen in the population so natural selection favors some variations over others, and that really, really depends on that particular environment. In this environment, that one's better. In this environment, that one's better. This produces organisms that are best fit or better fit to their environments. Revolution. Yay. So here's a common mistake. Some students sometimes think that the environment changes, and so the organisms try to produce good mutations to evolve in order for the species to survive. No, they just produce mutations. Right. Um, random. Well, random, exactly. So mutations are random. In a population, there'll be some mutation. If there's a mutation that helps, then yay, and if they're not, then the species might die. Well, in the population. Then, the, then that single one will die. Or that, that population Or the population die. will die if they're in a changing environment. Exactly. So one more thing I wanted to mention with this, which is just like, um, just like that, the <coughs> bless you, just like the insecticide one, is this thing called antibiotic resistance? Do you know what that is, David? Oh, it's like when you have a not a virus but a, a bacterial infection, I think, or something yeah. that like um, when you use too many medications on it, yep. it starts resisting. Exactly. I don't think I spelled resistance right. I don't think anyone can read it anyway. Okay, antibiotic resistance. So you're sick and um, you're in bed, although I'm drawing you standing up. It's so sad. You went and to you the doctor. you got doctors. your nightshirt on. Anyway, they give you antibiotics, and you take two days' worth of it, and then you feel so much better. Yay! And then the disease comes back in, and, and then you die. Yeah, and so what you've done is killed off, you spent a couple of days killing off 99% of the bacteria. And but then that, rest so that your white blood cells can kill the rest, right? Well, you try to, but that 1%, you're supposed to take the antibiotics, let's say, for 10 days. But you take two days, you feel better, and you say, eh, I don't, hate, I don't like pills, I'm not going to finish it off. So you've killed 99% of the bacteria, but the 1% that's more resistant to the antibiotics lives. And, the and you stop taking the medicine, and yep, that comes back. And now you have a whole body filled with it. And so you decide to start taking the medicine again, and this time you take it for another two days. And maybe a few of them are really even more resistant. Well, so, you take it for another two days and it doesn't do anything. And then, well, maybe it kills off a bunch of them and you feel better again, but there's still maybe 3% of the population that survives. Now, these go on and have babies. They do binary fission and have um, offspring. And those offspring are more resistant. 
and then you cough on somebody else and they get it and they do the same thing and what you end up getting is bacteria that are resistant to that antibiotic. All because of one idiot. Well, maybe a bunch of idiots. <laughs> but um, what you want to do is take the full 10 days worth of um, the antibiotic so that you're not sick. Make sense? Or so that yeah. you don't get these bad, so that you kill off all the bacteria. So that you don't kill someone else. Yeah, that too. Um, another example here of evolution is AIDS. So if you have HIV, totally different one, but if you have HIV, um, they can give you medicine for HIV and they can kill 99.9% .9 of the virus with one medication. And you're good and you keep taking the medication, um, but that 0.1% lives and guess what it does? It reproduces. It does, and now your body's filled with this type that's resistant to that, that to that antiviral. So you take another antiviral, and you get a whole body filled with viruses. So you take this other antiviral, and that kills 99.9% .9 of them. Shouldn't you just take both of them at the same time? They do do a cocktail of them now, but HIV, unfortunately, mutates really, really fast. So it's really bad at copying its DNA. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. And so, therefore, there's usually some virus that's resistant to all of it. But, yeah, that is how they treat it now. They do do a cocktail of drugs. Um, make sense? Yep. So there's evidence of evolution right in one, bo one person's body. And that is the end of my story for now.